من وقت دكتور ناصر الأحمدي دكتور ناصر The Chinese is not there. We have only one. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We'll start the Roche Symposium, and I'm very glad and honored to introduce my very dear colleague, Professor Hamdi Abdelazim, Professor of Clinical Oncology at Qasr Laini, Cairo University. And if I go through and introduce properly Professor Hamdi, that will take the time of the session. Very well-known figure in the field of oncology and known for his excellence performance in the clinical trials. And he will be talking to us about pertuzumab in her two positive metastatic breast cancer, the unprecedented success. Professor Hamdi. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alan, for your kind introduction. And uh, I know you have heard a lot of uh, treatment of the two positive breast cancer in the morning in the metastatic phase. And uh, I just want to, to revise with you uh, our milestones in, in, in the treatment of uh, uh, her two positive metastatic breast cancer uh, during the last 15 years or so. Uh, so let's, let's have a, just a hint on, on uh, the pre-trestuzumab era and, and where we knew that uh, uh, HER2 enriched breast cancer is, is probably uh, the breast cancer with the worst prognosis. Uh, this data came out by, by PAM50 uh, gene expression profiling of, of uh, a big number of uh, patients with uh, early breast cancer who received no adjuvant treatment. So you can see this as what we call the natural history of the disease, and that is the HER2 positive, ranking the, the worst uh, prognosis. So we, we all understand and we appreciate that HER2 positivity uh, is a poor prognostic factor, but why is this? We, we learn a lot about why is this one of these experiments actually was, was, uh, was very much intriguing, where it could show that in, in cell lines, HER2 negative cell lines, when you introduce the HER2 gene into these breast cancer cell lines, now uh, you, you compare uh, what happens into the cell from being HER2 negative to a transformation to HER2 positive, you will find that we have plenty of increasing in, in the growth rate, but more importantly, we have around 200 times increasing in the metastatic potential. And from a series of clinical trials, we learn a lot that uh, HER2 positive breast cancer before the era of trastuzumab, they had poor prognosis because of more visceral metastasis, especially into the CNS early relapse after adjuvant or new adjuvant chemo, although they respond to this new adjuvant chemo, and much less responsive to hormonal treatment. And the bottom line, we knew that the cell growth is HER2 driven, so it was very logic to try to target the HER2 function by, uh, by trastuzumab as first generation of molecules. The trastuzumab, that's the HER2 signaling pathway. Uh, I will not go into this, but trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against a certain epitope along the extracellular part of the receptor. If it does so, then it will downregulate uh, the uh, gross signal properties of HER2 positive breast cancer cell. It will shut down this, and again, uh, the trastuzumab induces internalization of the receptor, so in other ways, it downregulates the receptor expression. And more importantly, we started to understand a lot of, of the immune-mediated anti-tumor effects of, of trastuzumab. We have a lot of, of, uh, of, of studies to tell us that these drugs actually enjoys an immune-mediated uh, mechanism that is probably as equal or even more important than the signal transduction inhibition. Uh, of course, you're aware that we have uh, uh, several pivotal trials in the metastatic phase that could show us that if you add trastuzumab in patients who are uh, receiving uh, paclitaxel alone or paclitaxel plus trastuzumab, then, then we improve uh, the overall response rate, time to progression, and overall survival. And please remember this. That's the kind of the studies we had 10 to 15 years ago with the trastuzumab 
the overall survival with these studies when we have only one drug was around two years to uh, two, two and a half years. That's the overall survival. And for us at that time, we considered this as a very big success. Uh, Dr. Shana Dawood, which is a very uh, dear colleague to ours in, in the Middle East, um, actually, w she, she reviewed with her, her, uh, her colleagues in MD Anson uh, the natural history of, of, of metastatic breast cancer, the HER2 negative in pink, the HER2 positive in blue before the era of trastuzumab, and the HER2 positive after being treated by trastuzumab. And you can see that the HER2 positive now has similar or even better prognosis compared to HER2 negative. And actually, the logic question how we can do a better job. Trastuzumab is great. How we can do a better job better than trastuzumab? And we have at the present time at least four drugs, not at least, there are four drugs approved for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Of course, trastuzumab remains the, the, the backbone of this. We have pertuzumab and we have TDM1, which is practically a trastuzumab linked to a chemotherapeutic uh, drug, and we have lapatinib, which is a small um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It works inside the cell while the rest of the molecules, they are monoclonal antibodies. From the development of these drugs, we knew something very important, that after relapse of trastuzumab, uh, treated patients, you should all the time, I, I repeat, you should all the time target the HER2 receptor. And we have plenty of studies to tell us after relapse of HER2 positive breast cancer on trastuzumab, either you can keep the patient trastuzumab and you can add chemo and then you improve progression-free survival, or you can give lapatinib with trastuzumab and you improve again progression-free survival or you can give lapatinib alone or TDM1. We have plenty of similar studies to tell us that if we keep the pressure all the time on HER2 uh, signaling, then we improve disease-free survival, and in many studies, we improve overall survival. Then we started to understand more about the resistance to th these drugs, and we started to grasp the importance of another HER2 family receptor, which is HER3 receptor. HER3 receptor actually is one of the favorite, favorable receptors to dimerize with, with HER2. And actually, this study in nature could tell us a lot about what will happen into the cell with uh, uh, her family signaling, you can see that all the her family can do potent signaling or mild signaling, but the most important and relevant signaling is obtained with her two, her three signaling. That's to say, the her three is a good partner with her two in, in breast cancer development. And actually, her two, her three receptor pairs are the most active her complex regarding transformation in breast cancer. So the role, evolving role of HER3 was more and more crystallized. We knew that HER3 is a key signal and receptor in HER2 positive breast cancer. And we knew that HER2 preferentially dimerizes with HER3. And more importantly, persistent HER3 signaling is a common mechanism of resistance both to trastuzumab and to lapatinib. And it might be a much better idea and much rational idea to target the two receptors together. Let's see how this happened. If you give trastuzumab, you know trastuzumab will come here to bind to this epitope. We call it domain four epitope. And in the presence of trastuzumab, the HER3 is still capable to dimerize with HER2 and induce downstream signaling and induce disease progression. So the idea came like this. We have to see that we have another epitope here, which is called the amerization domain of the HER2, and that's the Herceptin binding here, and that's the pertuzumab binding here. In the presence of pertuzumab, HER3 will not be able to dimerize freely with HER2, 
in theory, this should improve the outcome. And actually, in the preclinical model, in patients who never received trastuzumab, you can see that the combination of the two drugs is doing much better job, that's to say, like in first-line treatment, compared to either pertuzumab alone or trastuzumab alone. Here we are. In patients who progressed after trastuzumab, in cell lines, in animals who progressed after treatment with trastuzumab, still the combo is doing a good job, but not like with, if given prior to trastuzumab treatment. So if we take these animal models and think how we can develop the use of pertuzumab in the clinic, automatically you will say that both pertuzumab and trastuzumab alone, they are effective but the combo is much more effective, and probably the combo is most effective if given early in the course of the metastatic breast cancer. In the development, we have a lot of phase two studies. I will show you this small phase two study reported some four years ago or five years ago. It's a small one, 66 patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer progressing after trastuzumab and chemo, and that is the outcome. The overall response rate was one out of four, clinical benefit 50%, which is extremely encouraging, and the median progression-free survival was six months, which is very encouraging. But what was more encouraging was the toxicity profile, where we did not encounter except grade three diarrhea. This combo will induce diarrhea all the time, but only 3%, and no grade three and four cardiac toxicity, and that's very relevant in this setting of patients. Dr. Jos, uh, the, the Cortez, again, had another design, which is a very useful design in theory making or, or, or hypothesis generating. They had a small number, only 29 patients of metastatic breast cancer failed on trastuzumab and chemo in, in the metastatic phase, and they gave pertuzumab for these patients, single agent. And then, what was very thrilling, if the patients, or when the patients progressed under pertuzumab, they kept the patient under pertuzumab again and reintroduced trast trastuzumab. So this population actually are receiving two drugs, they failed upon each drug separately. They failed here upon, on trastuzumab, and then they failed on pertuzumab. Let's see the results. That is the uh, efficacy results of pertuzumab single agent. It works, but it is extremely modestly working. And when the patients progressed under pertuzumab, now they are resistant to pertuzumab mono and resistant to trastuzumab. Then they reintroduced trastuzumab again and here is the outcome. The outcome is much better than you can imagine. The clinical benefit is 41%. And that's one of the very few studies to show us that you can re-challenge by target therapies after failure of each drug separately. You can see in blue that is the ejection fraction dynamics with pertuzumab monotherapy. It's very clear that this drug as monotherapy and when combined with trastuzumab, that does not really add to the cardiotoxicity of trastuzumab. So the decision was, of course, if we have this kind of benefit, then this combo should move to first line. And of course, you have seen several times the first line data, the Cleopatra data, which compared trastuzumab, pertuzumab, the combo, with Ducitaxel, or only the trastuzumab with placebo with Ducitaxel. Again, the primary endpoint was progression-free survival by independent uh, committee. And important in this study actually was that included a young age of, of, of patients, only 54 years, and uh, we have three quarters of, distant meta of, of visceral metastasis. But more important for me is just to remind you that these patients were not heavily pretreated. Only 10% of the population in this study were previously exposed to trastuzumab, and of course, we could see this kind of, of uh, uh, very significant and clinically relevant 
improvement in progression-free survival, six-month gain with improvement in the interim analysis of overall survival by around 34 percent. And this improvement was not by all means due to more docetaxel given in the patient seized by pertuzumab. You can see that the docetaxel doses, the median was eight doses in each of the treatment arms. So this gain was only for the introduction of pertuzumab. And as expected, patients who receive this as first line, actually they have the best improvement of the combo of the pertuzumab, uh, trastuzumab, docetaxel, while patients who receive this as second line after prior exposure to, uh, uh, to trastuzumab, they have same benefit but less remarkable prolongation. Uh, the response rate is something like the lymphoma or myeloma regimen. We have 80% objective response, and we have actually only 1% of the treated patients, 3% uh, of the treated patients, they progressed under treatment. Uh, that is the updated final overall survival presented during the last ISMO, and actually this is the first study ever in the literature of breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, in which we have a median survival almost touching the boundary of five years, and in which we have around 15-month uh, improvement in, in overall survival compared to the standard treatment. But please remember, when we had the first uh, generation of clinical trials with Herceptin, we have the median survival around two years, two and a half years. Now look at the median survival with trastuzumab, it is around three and a half years. And that's thanks to the presence of second and third and fourth lines of anti hr treatment. But actually, the introduction of pertuzumab in first-line treatment could get us the best ever results we had. And the improvement was seen in all the subsets. The cardiac toxicity was remarkable because actually the congestive heart failure, symptomatic congestive heart failure was numerically less and the decline more than 10 points or less than 50% was numerically less than trastuzumab alone. And more importantly for me is the recovery from congestive heart failure. You can see the vast majority, almost 90% in both arms, they recovered from the cardiac event. Uh, toxicity, of course, in my opinion, definitely related more to the presence of Ducitaxel, but if you add pertuzumab, you have more grade three neutropenia, neutropenic infection, and more grade three diarrhea. Uh, the, the peripheral edema and constipation was reported more in Ducitaxel arm. I don't have any explanation of that. Oh, in, in the trastuzumab arm, I don't have any explanation for that. But the bottom line that Cleopatra could demonstrate for the first time that we can improve drastically the overall survival by giving a better first-line treatment by using pertuzumab with trastuzumab and, and Ducitaxel. The improvement in overall survival is unprecedented, as I mentioned, and that's why it was a practice-changing study. A few days ago, we have another study to support the use of the combo with Paclitaxel, because I know that many of you, they don't like to use Ducitaxel if the patient is a little bit older in age because of the toxicity. And we have this study from Memorial Sloan Kettering to tell us that if you give the same combo of trastuzumab, pertuzumab with weekly paclitaxel, the same like we do, the 80 milligrams once per week, uh, you can have a clinical benefit again, like the Cleopatra study of around 84% progression-free survival is in the range of 20 months, again like the Cleopatra. And they segregated the patients, the number is not big, but if you give the drug as first line, again, is doing a better job than if you give it a second line. But if you give it a second line, the combo will give us a progression-free survival in the range of 16 months. So if you go to the toxicity, and that's the most important for me, why I'm showing you this study, is that febrile neutropenia was zero. 
as opposed to 13% in the Cleopatra using the Ducitaxel, and there was no single patient reported uh, symptomatic congestive heart failure. So that's very assuring results. The grade three and four side effects, the diarrhea, the fatigue, the peripheral neuropathy, they were all below 5%. So it might be a better, the, although the data, the approval for Ducitaxel, but Paclitaxel can stand as a very good alternative in patients in which you do not wish to give Ducitaxel. The NCCN guidelines, actually they took this step ahead and they told us that you can use the preferred regimen actually is pertuzumab, trastuzumab plus ducitaxel, and they put paclitaxel weekly as an alternative before this data were published actually. So, uh, what if taxins are previously given or the patient has uh, hypersensitivity to taxins or any contraindication of taxins? We have a phase two study, it's the VELVET study that is uh, um, trying to, to focus on the use of pertuzumab, trastuzumab plus venrolbin in two cohorts of patients. One cohort is sequential administration, that's the way we give pertuzumab, trastuzumab and venrolbin, or another device uh, uh, provided by Roche to give pertuzumab and trastuzumab administered in a single infusion bag followed by venrolbin. Anyway, we have the safety data of the first half of the patients, the cohort one, which is given in the classical way, is around 113 patients to tell us that this combination is extremely safe with grade three diarrhea in 3%, neutropenia in 28%, neutropenic fever in 2%, and the overall response rate is 62% with a progression-free survival around uh, 14 months. Uh, the final data of efficacy and safety will, will, will be presented during the, last, uh, the coming two years. Uh, if we, we have a little bit of movement to go to the new adjuvant phase, now we have heard in the morning, of course, that uh, the DWITO, the dual blockade of HER2 receptor, is becoming a sort of en vogue in clinical trials at least. And we have two ways of doing this, either to give trastuzumab with lapatinib, which we, which we call vertical blockade, or we give two monoclonal antibodies, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, which is, which is a horizontal blockade. And we have plenty of studies uh, with no real conclusion, actually, but we'll try to, to reach a conclusion together now in the discussion. That's the new sphere study, which gave ducitaxel plus uh, uh, trastuzumab, or ducitaxel plus uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, or a very unique arm of the two monoclonal antibodies alone with no chemo, chemo-free arm, or pertuzumab plus ducitaxel. And of course, we have seen that several times that the combo yielded a significantly more pathological complete remission than the, the chemo plus Herceptin. But what was impressive actually is the, the activity of the chemo-free arm where 17% achieved pathological meat remission. But if you go and to the subgrouping of, of these patients according to ER and PR expression, you will find that the combination of pertuzumab, trastuzumab with chemo actually fared a marvelous job in ER negative, HER2 positive, rather than ER positive, HER2 positive. Especially this combo, if you have a patient who is 75 years of age and you don't wish to give chemo, you can utilize an ER negative, uh, uh, PR negative, and HER2 positive. You can utilize the tumor antibodies with no chemo at all, and you can expect a pathological complete remission in the range of 30%. What was more attractive again? is this combo, is the side effects is in the combination of the two molecular antibodies when given. Here it is a real first line. You can see, of course, with the earlier administration of the drugs and chemo-free regimen, the grade three and four toxicity are practically zero in all items. Uh, in, in, in the Tiffany study, this group, they went one step further and considered that all patients might need the pertuzumab 
Trastuzumab regimen, and they tried to seek which is the best regimen to give FEC chemo, FEC with Trastuzumab, Pertuzumab, and I wish to remind you that that's not an approved regimen. It's not approved to give Trastuzumab concomitantly with anthracyclines, but anyway, that's what the study design for three cycles, and then Ducitaxel Trastuzumab with Pertuzumab here, you give the monoclonal antibodies for six cycles and compare this to the classic FEC times three and then you give Ducitaxel with the anti 2 regimen or the Ducitaxel carbo trastuzumab pertuzumab here it is an anthracycline free and you can see that there is practically no real gain if you give early uh, the, 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 the two monoclonal antibodies together and you can see again if you give the full chemo, like in, in this regimen, the pathogenic remission is extremely high, and it is even very high in patients with ER negative, HER2 positive. So in my standpoint, it is about time to start thinking of HER2 positive breast cancer as two diseases, the ER negative, HER2 positive, and the ER positive, HER2 positive, because you can see that the behavior and benefit of chemo and anti hair 2 treatment is definitely different in the two subgroups. Uh, importantly to tell you that the, the pertuzumab was the first drug to be approved for new adjuvant phase. This is the only drug that approved only for the new adjuvant phase for this approval before its approval for the adjuvant treatment. And the FD granted this approval for only three regimens to give, like the new sphere study, uh, trastuzumab uh, uh, with pertuzumab and docetaxel for four courses followed by surgery, or to give FEC times three, which is a favorable pr program for me, followed by uh, uh, a taxin with, with trastuzumab and pertuzumab for three cycles, and then you go to for surgery, or to give six courses of TCH with pertuzumab, and then you go for surgery. No matter what you do, at least for the guidelines, for the NCCN guidelines, you have to continue trastuzumab for, for one year. So the conclusion is new adjuvant treatment with dual HER2 targeted therapies improve likelihood of pathological complete remission. Trastuzumab, pertuzumab can be given with one out of three different regimens. I've just showed you the regimens, the FD-approved regimens. Unfortunately, the data for lapatinib concurrently with trastuzumab and chemo does not support the use of lapatinib in the new adjuvant setting. We have many caveats for the um, lapatinib use with chemotherapy for the side effects. And for the adjuvant therapy after trastuzumab and pertuzumab uh, based new adjuvant treatment, you have to complete one year of trastuzumab and to give, of course, hormonal treatment if it is ER positive, and that is the uh, NCCN guidelines for, for the new adjuvant phase, and that is the selected regimen. Already they, they introduced the AC followed by uh, taxotere uh, or, or paclitaxel and trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and they mentioned that uh, this is one, one step ahead, actually. I don't fully really agree, but it is for discussion with you that a pertuzumab-containing regimen can be administered for patients with more than two T2 uh, or not positive HER2 positive early breast cancer in the new adjuvant phase. Of course, we agree on that. But they mentioned that patients who have not received new adjuvant pertuzumab-containing regimen can receive adjuvant pertuzumab. I'm very skeptical for this because we are waiting for the study, the affinity study, to tell us how far is the gain of pertuzumab in the adjuvant phase. We know the gain in the new adjuvant phase. We know the gain is in pathological complete remission, not in survival as yet. So the final take-home message is that the combination of pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and ducitaxel as first-line treatment of patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer has provided the greatest ever reported magnitude in disease-free survival. It is six months. Overall survival, it is 15 months in, in this population of patients. As such, this effect is unprecedented, and the study is the most positive trial in the history of breast cancer patients. The combo of pertuzumab, trastuzumab, 
with chemo has been approved in her to positive metastatic breast cancer and undergoing new adjuvant treatment. We have three combinations for that. The toxicity profile, especially the cardiac toxicity, actually is very much encouraging to use the combination without fear of the cardiac toxicity. Of course, you have to monitor the cardiac function as usual, but the fears are much less at the present time. And finally, have we optimized the use of, 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 of anti 2 treatment during the last 15 years? The answer is partly yes. We, we now have optimized a little bit, at least for the first line and second line. We have more effective drugs and drug combination. We have more innovative trial designs. And we are a bit lagging in predictive biomarker, but at least we have one biomarker very simple, which is estrogen receptor expression for the prediction of the benefit of the anti 2 treatment, at least in the new adjuvant phase, but still remains drug accessibility should be crucial to all patients. Now to this point, I wish to tell you something. Uh, we have succeeded during the last two years to convince Roche and they actually complied to this and they were very cooperative with the uh, Ministry of Health in Egypt to provide uh, uh, trastuzumab at a 40% of the price for the governmental hospitals. And that's why now in our institutions all over Egypt we are able to provide trastuzumab in the adjuvant phase for our patients. That's a, that's a, 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 a great a step from the Ministry of Health to support this and from Roche to reduce the price. And I wish to tell you that as effective as the 1st of February, accessibility to the reduced price trastuzumab for all patients in every part of Egypt, including the governmental and the private sector, will be provided at 50% of the price. Having said so, I think we have brought good news in terms of science and in terms of economy, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamdi, for this elegant presentation. And uh, we still have uh, quite a time for discussion. The floor is open for discussion. Professor Sam. Can we have a microphone, please? Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hamdi Abdelazim for this very impressive pre presentation as we are used uh, to have from him. Actually, Dr. Hamdi, I have two questions. You have simplified greatly a very complex issue. But you have uh, mentioned that in the yearly studies, only 10% of patients have had uh, trastuzumab as an adjuvant treatment. Yeah. Nowadays, we know that nearly all patients receive it in the adjuvant setting. Yeah. Therefore, as the outcome differs in the metastatic setting with the use of the combination of pertuzumab, trastuzumab in the trastuzumab naive and the prior trastuzumab therapy, <clears throat> should patients who have had trastuzumab in the adjuvant setting be uh, subclassified for whom when developed metastasis would have the same combination again? Yeah. For example, patients developing metastasis while on the adjuvant uh, 17 cycles, should they have be re-challenged with the same combination blockage, or we have to look for them for another combined anti-HER2 blockage. Yeah, okay. That is, um, I, I will answer okay. this, and Please. then, and then okay. we will go for your second yeah. question. Uh, that's the subgroup analysis, as you can see, that uh, uh, for patients with prior exposure to trastuzumab, the progression-free survival for trastuzumab was less, and fair pertuzumab was less, but the hazard ratio all the time was the same. 
This means, this means that the benefit of adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab, whether the patient received or did not receive, is the same. The hazard ratio is the same. The benefit, the magnitude of benefit is the same, but of course, the progression-free survival is always longer for naive patients, for treatment naive patients. So to answer your question, I will get back to what was mentioned by, by uh, uh, Dr. David Cameron, who mentioned that the longer the better. It, it is, of course, for hormonal treatment, and it is, again, for chemotherapy and for anti 2 treatment. If the time to relapse is longer, always, your, your chance to rescue your patient by the same medication, in this case, trastuzumab, is higher. If your patient, the one you mentioned, relapses within one year, of course, this is a difficult-to-treat patient. Of course, it's a difficult to treat patients. And in some guidelines, they consider this as first line failure, you, you move automatically for second line. The second line for this patient can be TDM1 or can be the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab. We don't have a real study focusing on early relapses because, as you can see, this, most of the studies, they include a, 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 wide, a, a wide variation of, 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 uh, of clinical behavior of the disease. That's the first question. Yeah, thanks a lot. And see the tenure. Okay, Dr. Hamdi, thanks a lot. That's uh, what well, the message I, uh, I wanted to know and to leave, to leave it to everyone because actually nowadays we use uh, trastuzumab for all yes, patients. Yes, absolutely. Abs very relevant. Uh, yeah. The second uh, point, Dr. Hamdi, in the neoadjuvant setting for the use of uh, the dual uh, HER2 blockage. Patients also develop a patient going into uh, having neoadjuvant treatment and then continuing on trastuzumab. If they develop here a relapse before finishing the same course of trastuzumab, should be the rechallenging again with pertuzumab added to the uh, uh, trastuzumab in the, uh, in the adjuvant setting. Nowadays it's not an adjuvant, it is becoming metastatic. Or should we shift to another? Uh, drug like TGM1 or another combination? Again, a very, a very difficult to, uh, question yeah. to answer, Sorry. but, but it, it depends, actually, it depends uh, actually yeah. on, on what, if, if the patient actually, they had the pathological pretermission, I'm not expecting her to relapse that early uh, after new adjuvant treatment. You, you can judge this from the, the type of response at the, at the time of surgery. If the residual disease after surgery is quite big, then I'm not really surprised to have early relapse. In such case, we know that this patient prognosis is, is guarded, and in my opinion, she should be treated by TDM1. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Hamdi. Thanks. Professor Tahir. Um, Hamdi, thank you very much for uh, this uh, beautiful talk. First of all, just we are talking about the biology. You know, for the last maybe three, four, five years, all of I am talking about the preferential of HER2 and HER3, even before the pertuzumab issue. And we know now in HER2 disease, in, uh, to have a progression, you need HER2, HER3. Yeah. Uh, definitely you need that. And the other things, you know, uh, we start believing uh, every what we learn in the last 15 years, maybe it is wrong in terms that, you know, trastuzumab is blocking the HER2, which may not be true, that it is working through the AKT, BIBI3K, AKT, or through RAS, RAF, McIRC. And I think that I strongly believe that there is some immune modality playing a major role to let the trastuzumab working. Now, the, my experience with the pertuzumab in the last maybe two years, I warning everybody in the room, if you start pertuzumab, you have to tell the patient that may you continue for a more than 15 months of the combination. Because so far I treated 25 patients, more than 18 months, none of them has progressed. None of them has progressed. I am yeah. repeating again. Yeah. That's a, a good news for everybody. Yeah, yeah, this is a good news. That means you have to prepare yourself. And in fact, you know, to answer your question, that patient who is naive, Ya Hamdi, they are doing extremely, extremely yeah. well. Other things, you know, when you are using pertuzumab, after nine months, you start seeing a rash. And I don't have good explanation for that, why it is late 
rather than it's, it's early. It's immune mediated probably. It's an immune this is maybe yeah. another yeah. immune mediated. Yeah. So basically, in my opinion, that pertuzumab is the breakthrough. Yeah. And I think that you know, using pertuzumab and trastuzumab in patients with the HER2 positive disease, we are going to uh, yani, uh, see a better survival. Uh, I can tell you not much side effect from this combination after you finish docetaxel or yeah. weekly baclitaxel, and it is very, very nicely used over three weeks. And yeah. no cardiac toxicity. Th just, just to confirm what has been mentioned by Dr. Taher, that is the, the, the outcome of, of the Cleopatra study, and you can see that this progression was encountered in only 3% of the patients in the Cleopatra study, which is, which is very much mounting to what has been mentioned by Dr. Tahir, that disease progression, at least in the initial phase, uh, the initial six months of the treatment, you don't see much of disease progression, only less than 5% to, to, to safely announce this. Yes. Dr. Hamdi, uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's always like that. It's very uh, carries and good news. And the good news of today, there are many. The BFS improvement of six months, the, the overall survival of 15 months plus, and the, uh, the prices of the uh, uh, Herceptin will be for governmental and non-governmental. Uh, my question is, do you have an explanation? We always have a, an improvement in the PFS and another improvement in the overall survival, but they are more or less proportional, or the PFS is a little bit better than But here we have a, a 15 have months. A slide, just one slide to, to, to explain this. Yes. We have a 15 months improvement in the overall survival. However, we have only six months improvement in the PFS. Yeah. Yeah. Could you explain why and what about the secondary treatment after failure of the BHB, of the THB? Yeah. Please. Uh, may I have one slide or that's forbidden for today? Forbidden. <laughs> okay. Time uh, I wish to, the, the slide was already presented during my, my, my talk. Uh, from the preclinical model, uh, we could see that if you give intrastuzumab naive uh, animals, uh, the combination of pertuzumab and trastuzumab, six out of ten treated animals were cured. This did not happen if you give the treatment, the combo, as second line. I have the slide. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Very in less than a minute, but it doesn't work. Yeah. Here we are. Because sometimes uh, the, the, the preclinical data are actually essential for us to understand so many things. That is, in initial combo, like Cleopatra study, okay, uh, here you can cure the animals by the combination. It's, uh, here, if you introduce the combo after prior trastuzumab treatment, you do something good. The patients will grow like this, the disease will grow like this, but if you introduce pertuzumab plus trastuzumab, you will do something good for the treated animals, but not as impressive as here. Probably that's why if you start early, early hitting, early hitting of, of, of uh, the HER2 positive disease by the combination, you do something else other than, other than uh, uh, progression-free survival because you have the durability of response, which is something else that your ability of response can give you another edge for survival. If this theory, if I'm telling you, is true, then we should have a big benefit in the affinity trial, which is the adjuvant phase. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware they released this. I'm not aware they released this, but, but definitely because the, pro, the overall survival in the trastuzumab treated arm was 40 months, which is quite long. This means that, and again in the, in the uh, TDM1, uh, this means that you have very good salvage treatment for both arms. Okay. Professor Heber. It's 
not uh, fair enough in the year 2015 to have a young patient with her to enrich and you still cannot sponsor her by new agent. So I'm just taking this chance to put some pressure on Rosh and the Ministry of Health that we have to put it as new adjuvant. Okay, I, I, I fully agree with you, Professor Hamdi. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hamdi, uh, as regards her septum for you know, adjuvant, now they, we are writing the protocols for the for the protocols. Now we are is written for the national protocols for the cancer breast, and now it is added. Her septum is added in the new adjuvant setting. So now the, yeah. the, the Minister of Health is supporting the new adjuvant Susumab uh, treatment. Yes, That's in the, very good in the new I, protocols. Okay, can I just have a chance to get the last question, Professor Hamdi? And uh, from what Professor Tahir just mentioned, we know that we have different subpopulation within the HER2 population. Some have truncated receptors, some have abnormality in the PI3K, and so on. But still, your message on clinical grounds for the daily practice, which patients should go for chemotherapy plus trastuzumab alone, or a combination of trastuzumab and pertuzumab or lapatinib or so? What do you, what do you advise for that? My advice is um, it, it, if it is based on science, then first-line treatment for all patients should be, if it be clinical trials, I mean, should be uh, etaxane plus pertuzumab uh, and, and trastuzumab. If it is based on economy and I have a limited budget, uh, of course, I will choose the patients with the most high risk, that's to say the high visceral burden and the younger women and the ER negative patients. Uh, if ever we're going to have a study on pertuzumab, trastuzumab in, in our country, we have to get this study uh, for a subpopulation of the patients because we'll never be able to sponsor the study for the whole population. Okay, with that said, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Hamdi for his elegant presentation, Roche Pharmaceuticals, and the audience. Thank you so much. <laughs>